Hi. Welcome to week three in Religion in the Biosphere. And for Ancient Egypt, I often deliver the material uh, in a lecture on Monday. And then we kind of workshop some of the questions about that. So I think what I'm going to do is uh, give kind of uh, a lecture on ancient Egypt, Egyptian religion, especially as it connects to the natural world. Um, and then I'll have a question kind of coming out of this for you to think about. So what I'm going to do is share my screen so that you can see some of the slides and then talk you through uh, this tradition. Okay, so, and when we talk about ancient Egyptian religion, we're talking about a very long era of time, basically from what's called the Old Kingdom, uh, Egypt from about 2500 BC, and those centuries are the years when the pyramids, the Great Pyramids were, were built. And then we're talking about uh, stretching down to maybe the first century AD, the Roman era. We think of Cleopatra, um, and uh, various stories uh, that reach very late down to um, the dawn of Christianity, basically. So we have about 2,500 years worth of history. And ancient Egypt is a very conservative culture, meaning that they are always kind of drawing their cues from the past. And there's a lot of very um, stable representations and images that happen. So it's possible to talk about this a very long period, several millennia worth of, of time um, as having some level of unity. Um, looking at this image, this is an image of the Egyptian cosmos. So you'll note, first of all, that woman kind of stretched out with her with very long arms. Um, that is the goddess Newt, who's the god of the sky. Um, down at the bottom, you'll see a, uh, a man kind of stretching out and reclining on the ground. That's Geb, the god of the earth. And then holding up Newt is Shu, or air. Um, and this is when Egyptians thought about the cosmos, this would be an image for them to understand. Now, what is the lineage of the gods? How does this all happen? The, the story is that the god Adam, A-T-U-M, um, connected to the sun, so you'll sometimes hear Ray Adam, um, uh, that out of the primeval, primordial chaos of the waters, those waters receded and a mound arose from them. And that mound um, represents the god Adam. So it's this out of chaos comes order. Um, and the god Adam was alone, and so he masturbates and then Shu and Tefnut, air and moisture, um, uh, are uh, given birth to. And then air and moisture give birth to earth and sky, Geb and Newt. And then you have four children from that union. You have Osiris, the god of the underworld. We'll talk about him in a moment. Isis, Seth, kind of this chaos deity, and Nephthys. But what I want to underline for us right now are two things. First of all, that gods are living within our realm. Remember with Genesis, there was a God who was kind of outside of creation and whose word was creating it. And here we have kind of within the realm of, the gods are within the realm of creation. And Adam arises from the chaotic waters and then gives order um, uh, uh, out of that. The other thing is just like Genesis involved a series of divisions, um, we have something Sorry, I didn't quite catch that. we have something similar going on here in um, ancient Egypt with out of this primordial mound, then we have a division of air and moisture, water and air, uh, and then earth and sky. And the separations of these elements are what give rise to the cosmos. Um, Osiris. So Osiris is the god of the dead. He's often pictured like this. So you'll notice how his legs are together. This is a mummy form 
um, God because he's the God of the dead. He's holding the crook and the flail in his hands. These are signs of kingship. Um, and he's the, you know, the, the God of the dead, the, the ruler of the dead. Um, uh, in addition, you can note, and his, his hat is also connected to kingship. And then you'll note the, the skin color. Here it's this green color. And other times you'll see it with a black color. And what's happening here is that he is the God of, um, uh, of, 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 of death, but also of, of the ground, of earth, of, um, of growth. And so the soil of Egypt has this lush, dark uh, color to it. And that is where life kind of springs from. And so Osiris is, is there connected to this kind of agricultural birth from the ground. Uh, everybody who dies, so on the left here, you'll see King Tut um, in this kind of famous gold mask. And um, every deceased person from the king down to um, uh, uh, non-royal figures is identified with Osiris in their death. And so this is what this golden mask means, is that this is an Osiris, in this case, uh, King Tut. And then you'll see something else that was found in uh, King Tut's tomb is this kind of uh, 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 planting case. This is in the form of Osiris, but then it was planted with seed. So that's a kind of a, a very um, clear um, manifestation of that symbol of growth out of death. And this is, this is uh, I think, a really common thing to to see in ancient Egyptian religion is what is death? What is chaos? These are the fertile areas of the world. And out of that chaos comes growth and order. And the work of the living is to impose order on the world. But there's always something, there's something um, fertile and life-giving that comes from chaos and from death. Now, what happens when you die in ancient Egyptian religion? We have these books of the dead that would that were buried with the deceased, um, and these would contain kind of spells that the deceased could use as they get to the afterlife. And here's an example of um, uh, uh, the deceased, who's the man, and then his wife, who's over there on the left. They are approaching this really important scene of the weighing of the heart. You notice that up above, you have this, all the, these deities um, that are in, in observance with the sun god at the front there on the right, and then Osiris, uh, and then you can go back into these major deities of the Egyptian religion. So they're in observance, the deceased is approaching, and then here is Anubis, the jackal-headed god connected to burial, who is at this um, scale. And on the left-hand side of the scale is the heart of the deceased, their, their actions, their deeds. And then on the right is a feather, and that feather represents order, and that's mat. And so the idea is, have you upheld order in your personal morals, but also just in, have you contributed to order in the world, is one way to say this. Um, and if you, you know, your, your ticket to entrance into the afterlife is to kind of have those things weigh, be equal, that you've, you have introduced order into the world. Now, if you don't, your heart is heavy because you've done all these, you've, you've been an agent of, of, of chaos, basically, and, and, and have various sins on your heart, then you can see that your fate is that creature. And you, you know, here's another use of the natural world, that that's a composite creature. You see it's got the hind areas of a hippopotamus, it's got the midsection of a hyena, it's got the, the mane of a lion, and it's got the, the mouth of a crocodile. So anyways, those, that's, that's what devours you if you don't manage to get this, um, uh, to come out well on the scale between your heart and the idea of mat or order. Now we also, other things happen in the Book of the Dead too. Like we get these scenes showing um, the burial process. And over on the right, this isn't a great pyramid where a king would be buried, but you get a private burial when you can still see the kind of a pyramid shape at the top. 
Um, and then over on the right, you get a priest dressed up as Anubis, and then he, and then a coffin, which is stood up, and and there's various um, uh, uh, spells are being read over that coffin and the the deceased that's inside uh, in order to give a good afterlife. And then people are bringing burials. You can see another priest holding up a white piece of paper, reading probably the spells in the Book of the Dead. And then you get mourners coming after that, and then people bringing grave goods um, that will go into the grave, you know, things that were owned by the, the person. So here is the kind of the process of burial and death. Um, we explore this idea of order and chaos a little bit more. This is another uh, a very beautiful box for storing things that was found in the the grave, that complete grave of King Tut. And I just want to look at the illustrations here. So here at the front, you see um, war, right? That's one of the main jobs of the king is to bring order. And um, so here is the chariot holding the king. And then he's got his soldiers, his own men behind. And they are um, moving, you can, um, that they are going down south into Nubia. And and killing and taking over these this land. And the, the specific of the war isn't too important, but what I want to see is the way this is this box is kind of a drama between order and chaos. That there's Egypt and the forces of Egypt are here in nice um, uh, 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 rows. And then the king is in the middle with his bow and his powerful chariot. And then his enemies are basically disordered, right? That's a chaos that has to be mastered by the forces of order. And Egypt is a force of order. Now, if we look at another part of this same box, you'll see this. Here's the same thing. There on the left, you see the kind of the forces of order, the Egyptian forces moving in. The king is there with the bow and arrow. And now it's not enemies of a foreign nation, but rather uh, the natural world that's being dominated. Um, and so here are gazelles and creatures of the desert that are being hunted by the king. And I think what's important here is to see that nature is again in this place of chaos and disorder. There's a kind of fecundity and growth get, that comes from that disorder. But it's a, um, so life is in some ways dependent on that chaos, but then life is also about order and mastery of that chaos. Now, these, we're going to kind of walk through different um, uh, illustrations in burial chambers in, in ancient Egypt. And this is going back to the old kingdom. And you see so many motifs drawn from the natural world. Um, so here, I'll take a closer look at a second, but this is, you can see that it's in kind of um, fragmentary state. But we're in, going to be entering into the marshland. And you, you can look closely and it's very beautiful. You know, I, I love walking through these ancient graves, uh, ancient tombs and seeing these illustrations with beautiful representations of nature in these places. You know, and if, if you, um, people who know the Egyptian creatures and animals can, you know, these are all, these are recognizable birds and creatures. There's a level of realism here when we're talking like 2200 BC that is pretty, pretty amazing and remarkable. Now, the thing is, is, is that there's, there's these images of life in the Egyptian marshland, but then there's also the capturing of that life and the bringing of it. And so all of a sudden now you get these orders reinstated and now you have people bringing these cages and boxes of birds. And these are gonna be offerings that are being brought to the deceased. Um, here's another example of, of all these geese and wildfowl, their necks being wrung after they've been captured and they're again being brought as offerings to the deceased. Um, and I you know just want to underline again the connection that where do these things come from? These things Egyptians are very aware these come from the natural order, the disordered chaotic world of the marsh or of death. And then they're mastered and then they're brought to um, uh, made use of by the by the living. Here's another image. This is the hippopotamus. And the hippopotamus is the ultimate order of denizen, I guess, 
of the marshland, dangerous, um, uh, violent, and here it's being mastered by these harpooners on a boat, and and there's a there's a danger that's in that chaotic world. Now, eventually, um, people are interested. Also, you know, these these images aren't just um, images on in tombs just out of curiosity and interest and for beauty's sake, but they accomplish something magical. And so um, as time goes on, they won't just be on walls, but they'll also be models of these things buried, just kind of jumbled up. Um, so the idea here is that there's some kind of magical purpose to these things as well. Um, the representation of nature, but then also the ordering of it and the idea that that's something that will continue in the afterlife. Here's our harpooners again with a big fish. Again, just models. Some more images of this. Now, um, we also, just like we saw in biophilia, there's a, you know, Egyptians had a very delicate sense of life and, uh, the, and, and they valued having nature around them. And we see this in images of their homes. So this is a model that was buried probably because someone hoped to have this same kind of home in the afterlife. But you see that they had small orchards and then surrounding that, surrounding in the middle, a pool. Um, and then you can see the columns, the papyrus columns that are there for the entrance to a house. So they, you know, very sensitive to the natural world and surrounded themselves with it. Um, and this is uh, something that we, I think, would, would very easily recognize. It's kind of an ideal living situation that we head towards ourselves when we set up homes. Another use of the natural world is in amulets. So these are things that people would wear around their necks or on their body. And there was, you know, a, a kind of magical power in images of these creatures. And you see here a frog, a hippopotamus, and again, a very dangerous animal. Um, various kinds of creatures um, that you were even a ring and these are so the natural world has this kind of power lodged in it here's more I like that middle one the duck but also a scorpion and a fish and a looks like a dog an, uh, uh, an eagle or falcon right these are all there's this kind of power that's out there and uncontrolled that's in the natural world that can be then kind of brought in and introduced into culture Right now we're moving into the New Kingdom, so we're like 1200 BC. We continue to have these marsh scenes. These are going to be a staple of Egyptian representation for a long time. Same kind of purpose. You see the deceased and his wife over on the left, an offering table in front of them, and then they're kind of looking out onto these scenes of, um, uh, of, uh, of natural fecundity. So we've got a marsh scene, but if you look be beneath the marsh scene, you'll see grapes. Right? There's a harvesting of grapes, then a trampling on them, putting them into jars, and then pre ultimately presenting them to the deceased. Life moves from nature, the uncontrolled, the chaotic, into the controlled. And the same thing is happening with the marsh scene, where we have men on small reed boats, and then they have throw sticks in their hands. And what they're doing is hunting the wildfowl. And here you can see over on the right the way one of their throw sticks is breaking the neck of one of those birds. Um, and that is, the, that is kind of the hunting that, uh, that a, a high level Egyptian would take part in. See other things in there too. This is a different um, uh, tomb painting, but you see these nests and the eggs and then the birds, uh, newborn babies. There's a very, like I've said, there's, like, there's a sensitivity to the natural world. But it's always the natural world is, um, uh, is, is in these kind of more uncontrolled environments uh, where you see them, where you see it. You go into some tombs and a lot of it is lost, but you can still see the man with the spear. And so you know that what's missing was ultimately one of these large marsh scenes. Now, move into the Book of the Dead. We're still in the New Kingdom, you know, say 1000 BC, and it's filled with images of nature. Uh, and this is a bird um, representing uh, the the phoenix, the Ben Ben bird, and this is also a, uh, an, an image of rebirth out of the um, 
for the dead. It is a little bit more uh, complicated to explain and everything like that. But kind of what I want us to want you to see is that the the symbolic world of the ancient Egyptians was just filled with natural creatures. And at the end of the Book of the Dead, you get this image. You see the the pyramid, private tomb structure. Again, not a huge or you know kingly pyramid, but a small private burial with a pyramid on top. And that takes place in the Western desert. But then like, what is death? What does it mean? Um, for the Egyptian, the death wasn't like a, a sterile time, but it was associated with the natural world. So you see these papyrus reeds growing up out of this spot. And then you have this desert cliff that you can see in the background, the striped desert cliff. And then you see the face, the head of a cow coming out of that. And that's the goddess Hathor, the god of love, also with these nature associations. So there's, um, there's, I invite you to kind of think of this as a circle, that there's order, there's the work of the living, which is order. But what are you ordering exactly? Well, you're ordering this, these, the, the life that's being thrown up and, and delivered to you by the chaotic world of death the ground and the marshes, that this is where life is ultimately stemming from. And all those things then are have to be ordered by those who are living. That's this kind of eternal work of introducing mat or order into the world. And I, you know, that's kind of a positive. It's, it's pos I would like to see it as a positive way to see the natural world is that it is um, irrevocably linked to our experience of civilization and culture that we are dependent on death, on nature, on the uncontrolled chaotic parts of life. And so I guess that's what I want you to reflect on for this Monday is the extent to which nature is something to be ordered or something to be left alone. This is you know, also something you might think about with your, with your nature journals, but is this kind of ancient view of the world something that we can incorporate or that's of interest to us as we come, come to terms with how we value nature and see the world. Is this something that we see in American culture? Um, is, is the natural world something, a source of, um, uh, of life, of, 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 of energy and things? Or is it, is it something just to be controlled or forgotten about? How does this ancient Egyptian world differ from um, our concept uh, here in America and around the globe. All right, I will. Um, all right, I'm back on screen here. I'm going to end this lecture and um, and uh, see what you have to say on Monday. <laughs>